that is the last day of the rains. And it's marked by a special ceremony that the monks did this morning. Normally on a full moon day like this, we chant the Bani Mocha. But today instead we had something called the Invitation, in which each monk invites all the other monks to accuse him of any offenses they may have seen or heard or suspect that he's done that he hasn't made amends for. This requires some explanation. When a monk has committed offense, and or someone sees or hears or suspects that he's committed an offense, if you're going to talk to that monk, first you have to make sure that your motivation is, is right. In other words, your motivation is compassion, to help get him out of the offense. And then you approach him and you ask his permission to talk to him about the offense. And he has the right to say yes or no. And that yes or no can be based either on his own discernment or based on his defilements. Like if he has the offense and he refuses to talk about it, well, that's an issue of defilement. If he sees that you have ill will toward him, that's his protection. But there's one day in the year when the monks all have to Open the, open the floor, basically, and say, okay, I'm willing to hear any accusations. It's done at the end of the rains because the other monks who are there can be a good judge of the case. The monks have all lived together for three months. They've got a sense of who's who and what kind of person you are, what kind of person the other, the accuser is, say, what kind of person the accused is. And so they're in the best position to judge the case. So this is the ideal time to have this invitation to open things up to make sure that any long festering things don't continue to fester. And if you leave the reins with a clean bill of health like this, then it's, it's good for all the monks. It's interesting that the Buddha put so much emphasis on the willingness to be criticized. Outside of offenses, he said, if anyone criticizes you of things that are not related to the offenses, you have to show respect to them, whether it's related to an offense or not. This is in line with the fact that we're trying to correct our behavior here. This is a very different picture from what we often hear, that we're here to get in touch with our wonderful innate nature, and that goodness will just flow once we're finally in touch with that. From the Buddhist point of view, we need training. We have defilements. We have greed, aversion, and delusion, and they're just as easy for us to follow as kindness and a lack of delusion. In many cases, they're easier. So we all come to the practice with good qualities, but we also come with faults. And we have to be willing to see those. If we don't see them, we can't do anything about them, because after all, we're the ones who are doing the training. You have to learn how to observe yourself and be willing to admit your mistakes and be willing to admit other people's perspective, because sometimes your faults are right in your blind spots. This is why the Buddha says when someone points out your faults, you should regard that person as someone who points out treasure. In other words, here's an opportunity for you to improve yourself. And it's also interesting that when the Buddha says that we are reproving one another or someone accusing one another, it is an act of kindness if it's done properly. Here again, it goes against a lot of modern ideas about how people are hurt by criticism. But if you can't take criticism, how are you going to grow? It's an act of kindness because, especially if it has to do with offenses which are related to virtue. And people say, well, we'll just let that person follow his or her own way of doing things. It's not really an act of kindness. I mean, if they're totally resistant to any comment, okay, then you have to leave them alone. But if they're amenable, then you can help them. As the Buddha said, concentration nurtured with virtue is of great fruit. 
that comes from being able to observe your behavior and see where you're causing harm, first on the outside level. So you can apply that same power of perception together with its honesty to the inside level when you're sitting here trying to get the mind into concentration, focusing on your breath. If that observer is strong, you'll notice when there's some unnecessary stress, there's an up and down in the stress, and you're honest about what's going on in the mind. Because it is possible to get the mind into concentration without very strong virtue, but it's not going to have good fruit. In fact, it's often going to have bad fruit. Now, those people get a certain amount of mental power, and they can start abusing it. And at the same time, they don't see the suffering they're creating for themselves. Whatever discernment comes from that kind of concentration is dishonest discernment. But the concentration based on the habits of mind that come from observing the precepts. forces you to be honest, forces you to be alert, forces you to be mindful, to have all the qualities you need in order to be able to check your discernment as it arises. In other words, to see not only what the insight is, but also what effect does it have on the mind, what arises in the mind right after the insight. You're learning to look at cause and effect, and to be sensitive to when something is not skillful. Not simply go on the idea, well, whatever I do must be good, or whatever I do, I want it to be good, so I don't want to hear if it's not good. That attitude is going to give rise to lots of dishonest discernment. There's a good principle for everybody, whether you're a monk or not, to be willing to take criticism and not see it as harmful or hurtful. See it as an act of kindness. You're going to learn from it. In the course of learning from that, then it creates better conditions for your concentration practice and better conditions for the concentration to give rise to honest discernment. The type that really does put an end to suffering. It really does make a vast improvement in the mind. So as you're sitting here and meditating, different voices will come up in your mind. And sometimes there'll be some critical ones, and you have to learn how to deal with those skillfully. In other words, recognize when the criticism is useful, when you notice you're doing something really sloppily, or you're falling into an old habit that really is bad. And the voice that criticizes you is a voice you want to listen to. And the voices that are critical for other reasons, those are the ones you can let go of. In fact, it's healthy to learn how to let go of those ones. Not every critical voice in your mind is dharma. Remember that. Sometimes the defilements can get on your, your case because they want you to stop practicing, they want you to give up. So you have to learn to recognize skillful criticism from unskillful criticism. But be open to the fact that some of the criticism is skillful, it actually is useful. whether it comes from inside or from outside. John Lee tells a nice story of a time he was meditating, and a woman rode past on a bicycle, and she saw him meditating, and she started singing a song to taunt him, saying, I've seen the, the heart of this, this bird. It's just sitting there chirping away, chirping away, but it's really looking for food to eat. And she rode off, and he thought to himself, well, what she says is right. Here I look like I'm meditating, but the mind is off looking for other things. So even though she meant it as an insult, he took it and made a good Dharma lesson out of it. So remember, there are times when criticism is the voice of the Dharma, and sometimes it's not. But learn how to take a Dharmic lesson from whatever, even when the criticism is not in line with the Dharma. You listen to it. Listen to it carefully so you can see where it's wrong. And 
no, even a, an unskillful criticism can actually teach you a lesson. So learning to learn to be discernment in how you take criticism. And John Fu one time said that an attitude of respect is a sign of intelligence. In other words, you don't show disrespect to people when they criticize you. Because sometimes they may have something really good to say, and if you show disrespect the first time, they're just going to shut up. They're not going to say anything anymore. So you're willing to take the criticism and then use your own powers of judgment to decide whether it's worthwhile or not. That openness, which is what the invitation is all about, allows you to hear a lot of things you might not have heard before. Now, whether they're worth hearing or not, you have to use your discernment. But if you're not open to hearing them, you're going to miss a lot. 